pleased to welcome Brent Prezentka today from the Wisconsin Council for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Just want to thank you for attending. Really appreciate your supportive triad. And let me turn it over to Brent. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Brent, and then launch on into the presentation. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Brent Prezentka, and I'm with the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that was established in 1952. Um, early on, we did uh, mostly advocacy um, type things. And since then, we've kind of expanded um, who we are to provide services in the community. Um, and that's uh, what I do. I'm a vision rehabilitation therapist. So I visit people in their homes and help them um, adapt and adjust to, to any vision loss they might have. So it could be um, any safety concerns. So if it's kind of doing a lighting assessment in your home um, to see if there's ways that we can uh, make it better for you, um, if you're struggling with any daily living type tasks. So reading, um, using your computer, um, if you're struggling with, um, you know, you're using your cell phone, that sort of thing. Um, that's something that uh, I can help with. Um, there's also, if you're not, I, we're out of the Madison area, I should say. And if you're, if you're somewhere outside of the Madison area, there are other vision rehabilitation therapists scattered around the state um, that can also do the same thing. Uh, <laughs> We also have um, somebody on staff here that teaches technology classes. So if you're interested in um, learning how to use a computer or get more in depth into a computer, we have somebody here that can help with that. Um, we also have someone on staff that's uh, called a low vision therapist and they help um, do an assessment of your vision. Um, maybe find out what lighting is best for you um, the correct magnification that you might need, um, that sort of thing. So um, if, if you or anyone you know might be in need of those services, feel free um, to reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to help you. Or any other questions you have just in general on, on vision and, and that we can, we can help. So um, today I'm going to be talking about... Um, our eyes and, and how the aging process affects our vision. Um, so I'll kind of go through the different eye conditions that are typical in, in seniors and, and then different things that we can do to help adjust to those um, conditions. Um, pardon the train in the background there. Um, I'm down on Williamson Street here in Madison. So we get a couple of trains that go through a day, just bad timing. Um, feel free to jump in if you have questions um, while I'm, I'm doing the presentation. Feel free to jump in and ask them at any time. If you're like me, by the end, sometimes you forget what the heck you were going to ask about. Um, so I, I'd be more than happy to answer any of those as we go along. So um, our eyes, like the rest of our body, as we age, um, starts to get worn down and doesn't work like it used to, right? Um, just like the rest of our, our body parts. Um, so for whatever reason, I tend to always, you, you think that, oh, my eyes are different, right? That they're not, you know, they're not my knees that are walking wet. They're still gonna, you know, over time start to um, fatigue and break down. So typical things that you'll see um, as you age, and I'm sure many of you have already experienced these are, um, maybe your, your tear ducts don't work as well. Um, and that can come in two different ways. It could either be where your eyes tear more than they're supposed to, or they don't tear enough. Um, and usually your eye doctor, when you do your eye tests, um, it's part of the, the vision test and they'll prescribe drops for, for either one of those conditions. Um, the muscles in our eyes, um, start to weaken as we age. Um, so, what that means is um, like if I'm going to look at something across the room and I'm going to zero in on it, maybe one eye's muscles aren't working as well as the other eye. And so your depth perception might be thrown off a little bit um, when you're trying to see something. Um, and there's not a lot you can do about that besides just taking your time 
um, with your depth perception. So if you're, if you're walking um, or you're reaching for something um, to just take your time um, in doing so. Um, the other thing that um, happens as we age is we need more light. Um, so I'm sure most of us, I know at my age, I'm 47, I've already noticed that I, I need a light when I'm reading. Um, in fact, a, a study that was done recently said that at the age of 80, we needed four times the amount of light um, to do task type word work as we did when we were 18 years old. So that really indicates how, how important light is as we age. Um, and later on, I'll, I'll kind of go through different lighting options um, that make things a little bit um, easier for us. Uh, the other thing that happens as we age is um, we struggle a little more with contrast. So if let's say you're looking at something that's blue on purple, it's really hard to decipher, you know, what that might say if it's letters or, or something we're trying to read where contrast makes a, a much bigger difference. So having something that's black on white or white on black is, is much more important um, for us to be able to see it. And I always um, stress to people, don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. So let's say, you know, at your church service nowadays, a lot of times they'll put stuff up um, uh, like the, the hymnals or whatever, where you can read it, you know, and if they're putting it on blue, on, on purple, you know, don't be afraid to go to them and say, could you please put that, you know, in black on white or white on black um, to make it easier to see. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, I like pretty things too. So like pretty fonts and pretty colors are always nice, but um, sometimes they're not always um, practical for everything we do. So if you're involved in, in, you know, an organization or anything like that, that you're, you notice like, well, I really struggle to read this. Don't be afraid to, to speak up and advocate for yourself because chances are there's probably, you know, many other people that are thinking the same thing and they're, they're just afraid to speak up. Um, so the other thing that happens is um, as we age, our, our night um, vision um, decreases. Um, again, I'm sure most of you notice this. I notice it at my age where driving at night becomes much more difficult um, as we age. Uh, so uh, there's things that you can do to help, help that. Um, one would be to try to do most of your errands or driving during the day. If, if you can, um, if you are out at night, um, there are um, uh, certain um, eye filters you can wear if you struggle with oncoming headlights at night that can block out those blue lights. Um, they're called blue blockers. Um, they're yellow in tint. So I have a pair here that I'll kind of hold up. So this is and I'll put it down here. This is kind of what they look like. These particular ones, these can fit over, over glasses that you can wear um, even at night and they're not gonna make things darker. Um, so you, they also make some like in flip ups or slip ins that you can get. Um, this particular pair we sell here at the council, they're like $15. You can get some of the slip ins or clip ons for about $4. Um, so that's something that um, can help with that situation. Um, so other eye conditions that, that start to affect us as we age. Um, the number one eye condition um, that affects um, people um, as they age is cataracts. Um, I'm sure there's many people uh, here today that have had cataract surgery. Um, most of the time, the majority of the time, um, if you have cataracts, your eye doctor should be able to identify that. And it's usually just a day surgery um, that's done. Uh, what happens uh, with cataracts is over time, um, it's, it's kind of like your eye just starts getting dirty, right? Where uh, kind of like a window over time and it just it's a slow thing that all of a sudden you don't even hardly notice it until it's bad enough or it's like, boy, I, I don't see that as well. Um, and they do one eye at a time. Sometimes they might only do one eye. Uh, it depends. Um, 
I have to wait two weeks in between each eye uh, to do the surgery. Um, but most people um, have success with it. Uh, my my father, uh, he's he's legally blind himself. He's got um, ocular albinism, so it's a condition he's had since birth. Um, so he's never seen well. He's um, but he has low vision. Um, and as he got older, he he was really struggling to see stuff. And he had the cataract surgery, and he said he saw better um, at the age of seventy four than he did when he was eighteen after he had the cataract surgery. That's how much it had helped him. So that's the number one um, eye condition that, that happens as we age and hopefully with some um, surgery, it, it can help you um, see better over time. The, uh, the second eye condition that's most common in seniors is uh, what's called age-related macular degeneration. Uh, my guess is there's probably somebody on here that has macular degeneration. Um, it affects uh, about one in 10 seniors. And as you age, that percentage goes up and up. Uh, Age-related macular degeneration um, comes in two different forms. There's one that's called dry macular degeneration. Um, the dry macular degeneration is um, a, a more slow progressing um, eye condition. Um, it affects the macula in the eye, which is in the back of the eye, um, where your rods and your cones are. Um, and what tends to happen when you have macular degeneration is you start to get spots in your central vision. Um, so you just get these different, um, they're called scotomas, and they'll just block out certain parts in the middle of your vision. Um, so especially for task type work, like reading, all of a sudden you're, you have certain letters that are blocked out um, when you're trying to read um, or any sort of other task work that revolve, it, it, um, requires your central vision. So you might even, if you are talking to somebody, might have uh, their whole face blocked out if your scotoma is big enough where you don't know who that is. Um, generally your peripheral vision still works. So kind of, if you tilt your head and look out, you, you might be able to see that, that individual. And that's when it gets, you know, worse. Um, for most people, it doesn't get that, that bad, but it really depends on the person. Um, with dry macular degeneration, there's, there's not any surgical, surgical procedures um, that can be done right now. Um, they are working um, right here at the, at the UW of Madison is the, the lead university in research on macular degeneration and doing stem cell um, research. Um, and they've, they've gotten come far enough that they're at the, the clinical stage where they um, actually have people testing on these stem cell implants. Um, so hopefully here in the next cu couple of years, they'll be able to, to do some surgery, some stem cell stuff to, to make it um, where people can see better if they have macular degeneration. Uh, other things that can help with macular degeneration are magnification um, type solutions. So if you think about, if you have small print and your um, scotoma is blocking out a whole word, if you can magnify that word to make it bigger where it's only taken out maybe two of the letters and then you can kind of piece the rest of the word together um, that can help in, in reading um, type things. So magnification generally helps a lot um, for people that have macular degeneration. Um, Brent, I wanted to ask a question here. You know, my uh, optometrist says I have floaters. You know, I get like these little lines that cross my vision every once in a while, you know, and they're annoying, but they don't block out uh, entire words. These uh, scotomas sound like really difficult things to deal with. Yeah, because they're, they're going to be permanent. Um, those floaters, as, as you know, kind of come and go. Um, uh, whereas uh, with the scotomas, they're permanent and they'll, they'll never go away um, once they're there. Um, so it's, it's bleeding that happens in the macula and then it scars. And it, um, so if you picture like a honeycomb, right? Mm -hmm. And then a few of those honeycombs die. 
And so those are where, where you're getting those spots okay. um, that happen, ha that happens. The, and then the other, the other macular degeneration um, they refer to as wet macular degeneration. And that one is much faster progressing. Um, whereas the dry one happens over time, the wet one can happen really quick. Um, so it's, it's important that if you have any changes in your vision that are sudden, don't put it off. Don't, don't say, Oh, I got my, you know, eye test in three months. I'll wait and talk to them about it. Then if, if it's a sudden change, you know, go get in right away. Cause they might be able to, to stop whatever's going on. And that's what happens with met wet macular degeneration, there's bleeding that happens in the eye and they can, they can do shots a lot of times to, to stop that bleeding from getting worse. Um, they can't repair any damage that's been done, but they can stop it um, from getting worse. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that's highly recommended as far as, you know, making sure to, to get in right away if you notice any um, sudden changes in your vision. Um, so the, the third leading cause that's, that's all I have for macular generation, unless anybody has any questions on that. Okay. The third leading cause um, of eye conditions that happen as we age is glaucoma. Um, so with glaucoma, what tends to happen is there's going to be damage in your optic nerve and the optic nerve is the, is the, the part of, um, your vision that, that sends the signals from your eye back to your brain. So your, you know, how it works is our eyes take in the information that we're, we're looking at, and then the optic nerve sends whatever we're seeing back to the brain. Um, and with glaucoma, there's, there's damage to that optic nerve um, that, that happens. And what usually happens with glaucoma is it starts to, to look a little bit foggy um, with that one, you tend to lose your peripheral vision. So it gets foggier more around the outside. Um, and you really struggle more with light and dark adaptation. Um, so definitely need more light um, when you have glaucoma. Um, let's see. So I had a question here from Ginny that asked how often should somebody over 70 see an ophthalmologist? And um, once you get over 70, um, once a year is optimal. If, if, if your insurance, if they'll, um, if you're on Medicare, they should cover that. Otherwise every two years um, is, is what a lot of people do. But I would say go every year if you can. Um, a lot of times, because they're so busy, they'll try to make it every two years, but you can always advocate and say, I'd like to, to come once a year um, just to make sure that they're, they can catch anything um, earlier than later. Thank you. So Jane says that Medicare doesn't cover annual eye exams. So is, um, I think they cover them for some ongoing problem that you might have. But just okay. an exam, they don't cover it. Anyway. So every two years they cover, is that right then? Not sure, because I've always had an annual exam on my own insurance. Okay. So it must be every two years they'll cover it. Yeah, unless you have a certain eye condition, which most people, if you get over 70, you've probably got something, you know, if it's cataracts or whatever. But um yeah, I would check with, with your provider on that. Um, uh, the, the other um, eye condition that tends to affect people as we age is, is called diabetic retinopathy. Um, so anybody that might have um, diabetes, um, this is the eye condition that um, can come along with that. Um, and if you have diabetes, um, you, you already know kind of what you should do to help curtail um, your diabetes, and that would uh, also affect your eye condition. Um, with diabetic retinopathy, it's similar to macular degeneration when you get these scotomas on um, these dark spots. It gets a little more blurry than macular degeneration. 
um, what happens with diabetic retinopathies, your, your blood vessels in your eyes um, uh, start to start to die. And so that's why you get these um, different spots in there. Um, so those are, those are the major eye conditions that, that can affect us as we get older. Um, as I stated when I started the, uh, the conversation today, um, that's on top of kind of our normal, normal vision as we age, the other things that happen. Um, so uh, balance um, in staying safe uh, is, is key. So uh, when I talked about the eyes taking in the information, signaling to your brain, and then your, your body reacts. So let's say there's a, a decline or an incline. Um, your eyes take in that information and then tell your body, okay, I need to step a little safer down um, as I walk here. Well, as we age, because our depth perception is, is getting tougher um, and the rest of our bodies react a little slower, um, some of that stuff becomes a little more difficult to do. Um, our, our light sensitivity, um, our, it takes longer for our eyes to adapt to, to lighting situations. So um, it's always important to, to take our time. Um, if we're going in and out of buildings, especially if we're going from light into dark, just take a second to let your eyes adjust to that because it's going to take a little longer for our eyes to adjust. Um, and generally, um, when you inside and outside of buildings, there's usually steps. There might be different carpets um, that we're walking in on top of that might be a tripping hazard. Um, so just taking our time when we're coming in and out of buildings. I had a picture here I'm gonna show that kind of it, it demonstrates what I'm speaking of here. Um, let's see if I can get this to show up. Oh. Now, let me try something else here. Okay. So this is um, a picture of um, some steps walking into a building. And you can see it's, it's, it's dark on the inside, the outside's light. It's kind of hard to tell there how many steps there might even be, right? It, is there two steps there because of the, some of the, the tiling or are there three steps? Um, so there's actually just one step here. Um, but it, this is just kind of demonstrating uh, when you're walking in or out of buildings, how sometimes it's, it's difficult to see these things. Um, finding a railing if they have it um, is always always helpful just to make sure um, that we're um, being safe, that helping to keep our balance. Um, and then lighting uh, that we've talked about here, there's different types of lighting that we can, we can do to make our homes safer. Um, Usually these type of circumstances when we're coming in and out of our homes, uh, especially in Wisconsin here, if it's icy, um, if it's wet, um, you know, those are dangerous conditions um, when we're coming in and out of our homes. So setting up maybe um, a light that's activated, a motion um, detected light when we're coming into our homes. Um, I know like at my house, uh, the light switch for the outdoor lights on the inside. So in the wintertime, you're, if you're coming home, let's say at five o'clock and it's dark already, and it's, it's dark when you're walking in into your house. Um, so having a motion light um, outside that automatically turns on um, can help make it safer um, coming in and out of your house. Um, uh, the other thing um, that you can do is... Um, Take a little mini flashlight. You can get some that are even smaller than this one and throw it um, in your purse or, or pocket. You can get some smaller like keychain ones just to have on you all the time. So if you're not at home or if you're out and about and it's dark and it's you have, you're having trouble seeing something, um, you have some light with you all the time um, that you can use. 
So I got a question. Okay, I'm sorry. At, uh, Arlie has asked, um, does race play a factor in eye conditions that we were talking about earlier? And they do. Um, so like macular degeneration tends to affect um, more um, Caucasians with blue eyes. Um, uh, that's not way, you know, they're not, just because you have, you know, blue eyes doesn't mean you're going to have it, but um, ten, that tends to be the more, uh, the higher percentage of people that have macular degeneration have um, blue eyes. Um, uh, glaucoma um, tends to affect uh, more um, Hispanic and African American um, races more than, than others. Um, but again, every, and everybody can get any of these, but that tends to, um, they have a higher percentage um, when it comes to that. Um, so those, those two eye conditions specifically, uh, race can make a difference. So hopefully that helped answer your, answer your question. Um, so the other thing with lighting is um, any, anywhere that you have steps, um, basements tend to be a biggie. You know, if you if you have an old old basement that's you know dark and doesn't have new lighting that's installed, um, putting in some additional lighting there, and there's some different ways you can do that. Um, again, you could go with like a motion sensor light when you start going down the stairs; it, it turns on. Um, there's smaller type lights that look like this that you could have a couple of them going down your steps. Um, you can get some. Uh, that have like a, a light switch that's battery operated um, that you turn on instead uh, that can have, uh, you, you put these type of things down a couple and you hit a light switch and it would turn them on. You can get strip lighting um, at like hardware stores. So it actually tapes on um, the, the side of your stairs as you go down uh, and that's battery operated as well where you turn on the switch and it's just like a little like tape, rolls out like tape and sticks on, on their LED lights. Um, I put them on a few people's homes, on their basement steps going down. Um, so that type of lighting anywhere that you have steps out, you know, outside in the back. Um, if you have steps um, in your backyard, um, it's important to do that. Um, in... In your house, like overhead type lighting, um, in general, having good overhead lighting works best. Um, the, the table lamps that you have in your house that you might have on the, you know, your side table or something, um, they really don't do a very good job of, of spreading that light so that it really lights up everywhere in your home. Um, if you can't, uh, you know, if you can't do a whole redo in your house, and I don't expect most people to do that for overhead lighting, um, the Torshear lamps, they're called, uh, that have kind of come in uh, popularity the last 10 or 20 years. The ones that kind of point up towards the ceiling, they got like the bowl shape that point up. Um, those do a pretty good job if you have um, white um, ceilings, because what they're designed to do is reflect that light off the ceiling and then spread it over your room. Um, so if you have a couple of those, um, like if it's your family room, one or two of those usually can help, help a lot in, in general lighting. Um, if it's task related type things, so if you're trying to read or do some um, crafts or hobbies, um, having lighting that can direct the light right on what you're doing um, is the best solution. So uh, most um, most like hobby stores might have that. You can find them at hardware stores too. Um, they're referred by different names. Um, full spectrum lighting is the name of a popular one. Uh, they'll also call it blue lighting. So instead of like the traditional old incandescent lights that you, that you would have that are kind of like a yellow dullish type of light, um, these newer lights like the LED lights, um, or these full spectrum lights have more of a white or a blue type light. 
that really helps with contrast. So if you're reading like a newspaper that's got kind of like a grayish background on it, uh, the LED lights or the, the full spectrum and blue lights um, help make that look more like it's black on white. And you can get different variants of those. So you can get floor ones that have bendable necks. So if you're sitting in your armchair, you put it kind of behind your shoulder. So while you're doing something, it directs that light right on what you're reading. Uh, you can find them in table versions. Same concept. Usually they got kind of bendable necks where you can direct that light um, right towards what you're reading. Um, you don't want it pointing towards your eyes. You always want it po pointed towards um, whatever you're reading. Um, so those are the best options um, for lighting um, that you can do around your house. Any questions on, on that? There was a okay. question uh, in the chat box, uh, Brent, real quick on uh, does uh, high blood pressure worsen glaucoma pressure? Um, yeah, it, it, it does. Um, so yeah, glaucoma, there's pressure that gets put and they can, um, a lot of times do, do drops that help take down that pressure. Um, but your blood pressure really affects any blood flow in any part of your body. Um, so that would definitely be something to consult with your, with your eye doctor about, um, if, if they haven't talked about it already, usually it should be under their radar. Um, but yeah, it definitely does. I was wondering about, uh, you know, the different types of light, you know, in the evening, you know, if I have these uh, blue lights on, you know, they say, well, blue light interrupts your sleep cycle, right? You should stop using blue light at a certain <laughs> time of the day. And, uh, are there any, I mean, there must be something in between, uh, you know, the blue light and, uh, yeah, yeah, I like the traditional light, but I can see where as you get, you know, vision difficulties, you would want to optimize, you know, your vision more than your comfort, I suppose. Yeah, you bet. Good question. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, Cause there are um, lamps now where you can adjust um, both the color of the light. Um, so you could go from the, uh, the blue to a white to a soft yellow. The other thing you can do on some of these newer lights is adjust the brightness of that. So even if you still had like the blue or the white light, you can make it a dimmer version so it's not so bright. Um, one of the name brands I know that's out there for those type of lights is called Verilux. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it depends, uh, the cost of those can vary, um, anywhere from $50 to, you know, a few hundred dollars, depending on, you know, the lamp you get, but I would say you could get a pretty good quality one for 50 to a hundred dollars, um, that type of light. So Verilux is the one that, that I'm most aware with of. Mm -hmm. If you're working in the kitchen, I mean, I'm thinking, uh, you know, we were thinking about revising uh, some of the lighting under our uh, cabinetry and whatnot so that we don't cut the end of a finger off, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you have for people uh, for kitchen lighting? Yeah, yeah, there's some pretty simple solutions for, for kitchens most of the time. Um, you can go to any hardware store and they have some pretty good under cabinet type lighting that's battery operated so you don't even need to plug them in. Uh, most of them have LED lights. Um, you can direct that lighting. Um, those cost uh, about $20 or so for each, each one um, that you can put under. Uh, you could always go, you know, more expensive if you really wanted to redo lighting and have a um, the lighting professional come in and electrician and install. Um, but you can do it on your own, just going to Menards and buying three or or however many to put under your counter. And it really does make a big difference because if you think of the light up above, it's getting blocked by those cabinets a lot of times. So your counters, um, a lot of times are blocked from that light. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to say, we put a light in um, over our sink and that helps a lot. Um, otherwise I couldn't even get the dishes clean because I was missing 
stuff on there. And with that light on, it makes a big difference. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And did you do that um, by just going to Menards or something and getting uh, one of those? Kind of thing you were talking about where you just stick it up under your cabinet. Yeah. So cupboards up above the sink and then we put it up there. And that helps a, a lot. Otherwise, I miss stuff when I'm doing dishes. Sure. I wanted to show, I, I've got this little device that I bought off of Amazon and it's got a little light at the bottom so you can turn it on and um, it, it lights, it goes over your neck and then lights the paper below you. And um, it's not perfect, but sometimes when I'm sitting in a room that doesn't have good overhead lighting, this has worked. So it's just something to look for um, as another option. That's kind of cool, Jane. I've never seen yeah. one. Yeah, and it's got little wiggly. This this thing wiggles, so you can like aim it toward your book or whatever. I found that since I've had I had cataract surgery, and it seems like now sounds weird, but I need more light than I did before. I need a lot more light to read, um, hmm. and so this little device. Uh, it's not perfect, but um, um, it's another option. It's hard, the room I like to sit in, it's hard to put a lamp because then it's going to be in the way. So, and I don't remember, this was like maybe 20 bucks or something. It wasn't very expensive. And I think it's got a name on it. Let me see. Actually, it doesn't. <laughs> I think I just looked up like lighting little things on Amazon. Anyway. Okay, what thanks for people? sharing that. Yeah, what kind of an expert would you go to? I mean, you've obviously studied all of these kind of things. Would your average electrician know uh, how to retrofit a, you know, house lighting for a, a person who's going to age in place? Probably not. Um, so you, yeah, your best bet would be to um, either have. Uh, you could uh, meet with a low vision therapist and they can do lighting exams with you um, to find out what light um, you prefer, what's optimal for your vision. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have one here on staff. Um, UW has a low vision therapist. Um, if you're a veteran, they have one at the VA. Um, I think Davis Dewar actually just got one too here recently. Um, so that's something to, to consider if you really want to find out what lighting is optimal for your vision. But most electricians, they're just going to, you know, kind of put in whatever's bright. They're not going to know what might be best for each person. Because some people are light sensitive so that you, you know, they might not want the, the brightest lights out there. Um, we, it looks like I got another question here. Um, Carol asked, how long are injections recommended for branch retinal vein occlusion? And um, I, 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 I'm afraid I can't answer that. Um, I leave that up to, to, for you to ask your um, ophthalmologist um, that question. Um, I just don't wanna over speak and yeah. So sorry, I'm not gonna be able to answer that for you. Um, and then she also asks, is there a point where it's uh, been going for several years with injections that you should stop if it's not helping? Yeah, again, I'd ask your ophthalmologist. Maybe it's helping keeping it at bay. So maybe it's not getting better, but it's, it's helping keep it stable at least. Um, I'm sure it's annoying having to go in and have them put shots in your eyes. But um, if it's helping keeping them stable, then it's probably worth it. So that, that would be my two cents on it. Um, okay, so other things. Um, okay, it looks like Jane said the LED neck reading lights about $22 on, on Amazon. So other things that we can do around our house to make it safer. Uh, we talked about contrast early on and how um, our contrast sensitivity starts getting worse as we age. So, I mean, most of us kind of have our homes um, memorized as far as where steps might be. But think about if you have visitors too, you might have people visiting that aren't 
Maybe they don't know there's one step down from your kitchen into your family room or that sort of thing. So just making sure that, um, that that's easily defined if you can. Um, uh, I know we, we want our homes to look nice. So um, if there's ways you can do that, there's, uh, you know, different tape you can get um, that you can put just on the end of the, the step. Um, so it might be, you can get some tactile type tape uh, that's different colors. So like yellow, they mix it with, it's like sandpaper type of tape. Um, so you, and you can get it in different colors. So like I have one here that's yellow. Um, that you would tape down. A lot of people will do that more outside on their cement type steps. Um, and you can do that anyways, um, just for tactile reasons. So if you have cement steps outside that get slippery when it rains, um, some of that tape that's got sandpaper or, or sand in it um, to make it a little more tactile um, when you're walking down your steps can be helpful. Um, you know, throw rugs are always a tripping hazard. Um, any sort of um, anything that sticks up a little bit um, can, might be a tripping hazard. Other things that can help with um, our contrast um, when we're outside uh, are, are different sunglasses. They're also um, referred to as um, eye filters. Um, so the typical sunglasses are gray, right, where they're blocking out the sun. You can get that gray in different um, variants of tint. Um, it's called light transference. It's kind of the, the technical name for the variance of tint. So if you had something that's 0% light transference, that means it, that it's letting in 0% of the light, so it's completely black. Um, the lower end of sunglasses that are dark are, you can, about 4% is about as dark as you can get it. Um, ideally, you know, we need some vision come, or some light coming in to be able to see. So it's trying to find that balance for each person to find out, okay, how much light is best for me? And then kind of finding, do I like a lighter gray? Do I need a darker gray? It may vary on the day. So if it's a bright sunny day in Wisconsin in the wintertime and there's sun and you're getting glare coming off of the snow, you may need a darker pair. Um, for those type of situations than if it's kind of a, a, a hazy day where the sunlight isn't as bright. Um, typically, grays and amber colors are the two that are best for sunlight to block out that sunlight. And everybody's eyes are going to be a little bit different with what they might prefer. Um, so the best way to go about doing that um, is to go to some place that has a lot of options and, and asking them if you can try them on outside um, in the sun, hopefully, if, if that's the type of day you're looking to um, try to figure out. Um, so we, we have those here at the Wisconsin Council of Blind. Uh, we're at 754 Williamson Street, um, where you could come in. Most of those sunglasses, you're looking at about $15 to $25, so it doesn't cost a ton. Um, otherwise, it's your, it's your eye doctor. They usually have some. Um, it's a matter of, will they let you go and, and try them outside um, when you're doing it? That's also something a low vision therapist will do is to find the right eye filters um, for you. So the grays and the ambers, they're ideal for um, sunlight, for, for helping block out some of that light. But then there's also times that we need um, brightness that maybe it's a darker overcast day and it's harder to see. Um, and that's where the yellow and orange tints tend to help. Um, they can help brighten things. Um, they can help with contrast. Uh, we talked about the yellow helping with blocking out the blue lights at headlights, um, but they'll also help um, brighten things um, on a darker day. You know, oftentimes see um, professional shooters will be wearing orange or yellow sunglasses because it helps with the contrast on the target that they're looking at. Um, looks like I missed something here. Jenny talked about um, throw rugs with latex back on polished floors. Um, you removed when your mother-in-law had visited and she slipped on the polished area of the floor in the bathroom. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. The, 
Um, I should have mentioned when I was talking about rugs. Yeah, if you can get some some of that latex um, and put it underneath the rug so it's not slippery. Um, if you have uh, throw rugs that are on, uh, on a hard floor, um, getting some latex and putting that underneath it to make it not as slippery um, helps. Brent, what, I'm wondering about driving. What kind of uh, special considerations are there for driving? Yeah, um, so, you know, reaction time as we mm -hmm. age, it's a little slower. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, if you can do most of your driving during the day when there's better light, um, mm -hmm. that helps. Um, trying to stick to local routes um, that you know where the turns are, um, that sort of thing. If you're going to be on uh, the interstate or a busy city, trying to do that when the traffic isn't as high um, are good recommendations. Um, and kind of knowing yourself, being honest with yourself, um, it's a hard thing to sometimes accept. Like, oh, I don't see really well here, I'm, but I, you know, I'm going to the store anyways, and you know, you're nervous the whole time driving there. So, you know, just trying to know yourself and and you're being safe for yourself and others around you. Mm -hmm. Are there any, uh, I mean, I see some people wearing those uh, really big dark glasses. Uh, are there any complications with those so far as peripheral vision? I mean, they keep the, you know, I suppose they make the, I, I've never tried them, you know. Yeah. It just looks they dangerous were... to have something on the side of your head like that. Well, it depends. So if you're really light sensitive, you might need that side protection so light mm -hmm. isn't sneaking in. Um, and it's, so it's really going to be a personal preference. Um, mm -hmm. some people like myself, that would be too dark. I'd probably take those things off in a second. I prefer a little lighter type gray or lighter amber when I'm driving. Um, some people will get just the, like clip on one. So, uh, mm -hmm. it's easier to, if all of a sudden you're going from light into dark, it's easier to flip them down quickly rather than have to pick up a pair of sunglasses and do that while you're driving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Good, good question. Thanks. So some other things that we can do just to make sure we're maintaining um, the healthiest eyes. I mean, sunglasses are good. They protect your eyes. Um, sunlight does, does damage your vision. So wearing sunglasses um, when you're in the sun uh, is helpful. Um, as always, a balanced diet, um, is good. Um, smoking is really bad for, for your eyes. Um, you know, sugar does affect your, your blood vessels. Um, some of you may even notice if you have a lot of sugar, you may get a little blurry vision. So if you're eating too much sugar in one setting, you know, moderation is better, but this, this is true for pr pretty much all of our body, right? Um, a good, um, balanced diet of like healthy um, vegetables. The like to say the more colors you can have in your diet, the better. So, you know, carrots and you know leafy greens and any sort of vegetables, bright in colors, um, are good for our eyes to maintain um, our healthy vision. You can you know taking a basic vitamin um, works as well. Um, there are some. Um, vitamins you can take that are specific um, for eyes. Um, I would I would consult with your eye doctor there because uh, you can be misled. You know, there's certain, like any medications out there that they'll tell you they're going to do wonders and, it, you know, they might not be all that they're cracked up to. So I would ask your eye doctor and see what they suggest um, if you're going to take a specific vitamin for your eyes. Um, Cleaning your eyeglasses if you wear eyeglasses. Um, it's one of those things that until it gets bad enough, a lot of times you don't do it, right? Like, oh, geez, now I'm really, but so the more often you can clean your eyeglasses, the better. If you have bifocals, just be aware um, that when you're going down steps, you know, your bifocals at your bottom or trifocals are meant for reading. They're not meant for distance, for looking at those 
two steps ahead of you. So making sure that you're tilting your head so you're looking through the right pair of your glasses when you're, when you're going down steps um, can be helpful. And then as we talked about at the beginning, you know, the more regularly you can see your eye doctor um, so that they might catch something as quick as possible, the better. Um, let's see, it looks like I had another question here. Uh, Arlie asked, does eating too much sugar have a long lasting effect? Um, you know, it, it can, if, if you're eating too much sugar, it does affect your, your blood vessels over time. Um, but don't, it's not like, Hey, don't eat a, a cookie. Cause your eyes are going to go bad the next day. Right. It's, you know, don't have a box of, especially these days, Girl Scout cookies are all over the place. Right. Just, you know, have a couple and set them down. And if you want a couple later, that's fine. It's just, you know, just don't eat the whole box in one sitting type of thing where all of a sudden your body's trying to figure out what to do with all this sugar. I can see that in a police incident report down to package a Girl Scout cookie <laughs> and go <throw> down the stairs. <laughs> right. Oh boy. So other things around your house, you can, you know, having less clutter always helps. Having things as organized as you can makes things, uh, easier to find, safer. Uh, otherwise, that was that's all the information I got for you. So I, I'm more than happy to stick around as long as I need to to answer any questions people may have. Um, Brett, can we find your office online and find out what hours you're open? And is it necessary to make an appointment to come in? Yeah, good question, Jane. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, so we're located at 754 Williamson Street, which is uh, pretty close to downtown near the Capitol. We're seven blocks from the Capitol on Williamson Street. Uh, we're open to the public 8.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Thanks, Mike. And what's and your phone number, uh, by the way? I'll type yeah, our phone number here is area code 608-255-1166. And we're open 8.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday to the public. There's no um, appointment needed to stop in. If you were going to stop in and visit us, some of the things you might find here are different lighting Um Lighting solutions, so table lamps, floor lamps, um, a variety of different magnifiers um, that you can try, uh, the different sunglass filters um, that we talked about that you can, you can try out, um, large print clocks, large print watches, um, large print playing cards, um, things of that sort. Um, if you did want to meet with our low vision therapist, you do need an appointment for that. So that you should call ahead for. I was wondering, is your organization involved in advocating uh, for uh, low vision uh, causes? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, we definitely are. Um, so that's how we got started. We've continued that. So our director here does a great job of advocacy work. So some of the, the recent things that, that we've been involved in um, are voting, since that, that's been a pretty hot topic, making sure that there's accessible means for people that are visually impaired um, to vote that doesn't make it so difficult. Because um, let's say you're totally blind, you don't have um, a driver's license, and now you gotta, you gotta go to the DMV and get a, a photo ID. Well, now they move the DMV way the heck out to the Middleton area. So if you don't drive, you got to find a bus that goes out there. And the bus that goes out there only goes out a couple times a day. Um, and then if you got to get down to your voting facility, um, you know, you need to be able to get there. Are those voting machines accessible? Um, so those are some of the, the things we've been working on in, in voting. And transportation is kind of the the other one that we're pretty involved mm -hmm. with, making sure that there's transportation available for people 
um, that uh, might not have access to, to driving. So if they're visually impaired, um, especially rural areas, you know, if you live out in, in a rural area, um, it, there's no public transportation a lot of times that you can easily take, especially from county to county. Um, usually within every county, they have um, some sort of transportation that you can find for seniors or those with disabilities, but you can't go from one county to the next. Um, so it's, it's definitely a problem for many people. So those are the two main areas lately we've been focusing on. Thanks for asking, Mike. Sure, sure. Now, if other people, I mean, we have people from various parts of the state here who might want to have a presentation, how could they get in touch and set up something? With sure. You? Yeah, um, well, you can you can reach out to us. Just uh, give us a call here. Um, it might depend on your topic. If you get me or if you get somebody else, um, depending on, on what you're asking for. But like, so we could do a presentation on advocacy type things or transportation things in your community, um, or if you need us to speak, you know, um, on behalf, or if you have any questions on laws or that sort of thing. You can always read, reach out to us. So I say it was so uh, Brent and uh, the people there at the council were so accommodating. Uh, we just made a request and, you know, we got an immediate reply. And before you know it, we had uh, a presentation set up. So I encourage uh, you to go ahead and follow up on that, Arlie. You bet. Um, I had a, uh, yeah. And, and then if you needed any sort of in-home um, type type stuff, that's that's what I would help with so I can come to your home. There's no cost for me to come out um, to visit you um, and do kind of, I can do you know, safety assessment of things, um, vision related or uh, some of the other stuff I had mentioned earlier, if you're struggling with reading or seeing your computer, that sort of thing, I can help with that. Um, these days, um, so technology has been, you know, good and bad. So like, um, there's ways to use your phone by speaking to it. Um, there's a learning curve with that. Some people find it more frustrating than helpful, um, or some in-home, um, type devices like Alexa, if you're familiar with, with her or Google home, where you speak to it and it, it can do different things for you. So you can connect it to say, Hey, Alexa, turn off my lights and she do so, or hey, Alexa, what's the weather? You could, Alexa, set a timer. Um, so it could help make things a little easier. And of course, there are all the security issues around those as well. We're working on setting up a presentation for later in the summer about uh, security issues associated with these personal devices. And so sure. uh, keep your eyes open for that uh, at some point here in the near future. Yeah. Yeah, that is definitely the question many people have when they're getting those devices is how secure. So, so any other questions, please, everyone, if you have something, chime right in. Otherwise, we're going to let Brent uh, get back to work. Yeah, Abigail. Thank you, Brent. That's been very helpful. Well, good. You bet. Glad I could help. Okay, well, seeing no more questions, uh, Brent, I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. A lot of terrific information and uh, really grateful for your uh, uh, meeting with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Glad everyone attended. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, keep your eyes out for the next meeting, everyone. We'll be uh, back in April with a presentation on choosing safe housing for seniors. So long. All right, bye.